It's one oh nine p.m. in Los, in Studio City on uh, Tuesday, the eleventh of June, two thousand and thirteen. I'm Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia News. I'm about to talk to Tom Belstorff, who's a professor of anthropology at the University of California at Irvine, and the author of Coming of Age and Second Life, which we're going to talk about. Welcome, uh, uh, Professor uh, Belstorff, to uh, Utopia News. You're, um, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, what were your goals in undertaking an ethnographic study of Second Life? Um, well, I'm an anthropologist who's been uh, doing research in Indonesia for 21 years now, which is hard to believe. And about 10 years ago, um, when I got interested in trying something new after having done research in Indonesia for a while, I was interested in technology and became interested in virtual worlds and as a kind of experiment thought I would um, try using an uh, anthropological research approach similar to the one that I use in Indonesia, as similar as possible, and see if it would work or not, and see what there was to learn. So I really went in with a very open agenda that I just wanted to, to see what I could see, really. Did you have forebears? Were there people who have tried an anthropological study of Second Life prior to you? Um, well, I have many forebears, not so much with Second Life itself, because when I started studying Second Life, it had only been in existence for about a year. It was just about a year out of beta. Um, but there are um, sociologists and anthropologists and others who have been using ethnographic uh, approaches to look at text-only virtual worlds at MUDs, you know, going back uh, a decade or more before my Second Life book. And so I definitely was building on, on the wonderful work of, of earlier colleagues. And I actually have a whole chapter in my, my book about that history, because I think especially when we're talking about technology, nowadays there's such a tendency to hype the new and to talk about how everything is new, that particularly when we're talking about digital culture and digital media, thinking about history is really, really valuable and important. Okay, talk about the methods that you used in your study. Well, the methods that I used in my study were are really the basic ethnographic methods that, that almost any ethnographer will use. And the, the fundamental method is participant observation, where you're getting to know a community and, in some sense, becoming a member of the community, but participating in everyday life. And what's so valuable about that is that so much of our lives is not directly available to our consciousness that if you ask someone a question in an interview you get an interesting answer but if you ask someone what is love they're gonna say something but it may not really be like what it is when they're actually falling in love or in love with someone so spending time with people in their everyday lives is really valuable and so that's the core method but then I also did a lot of interviews and those are very valuable and I also did focus groups group interviews which was um, quite easy to do in Second Life because people were already meeting in groups and then archival research which includes historical research but also looking at texts and, and, and videos or other kinds of things that people um, produced. People have been blogging and writing about Second Life, making little magazines and stuff from the very earliest days of Second Life, and that can be really valuable data as well. So those are the sort of main uh, sources of data that I used as an ethnographer. Does the virtual world of Second Life have its own culture? <clears throat> well, in a sense, yes. I mean, the for anthropologists and others, the definition of what counts as a culture, or the boundaries of a culture, is very interesting and complicated because uh, cultures are very porous. And so it's like saying, is there such a thing as American culture? Well, yes and no. There are some common things around American culture, but America is a very multicultural place as well. And Second Life is a similar kind of thing. There are some common patterns that you see in Second Life. There is a kind of culture, but there are a lot of subcultures inside of Second Life. And then in the other direction, there's a lot of things that Second Life shares with other virtual worlds, cultural norms like around avatar bodies, for instance, that it also shares with online games like World of Warcraft, and even with broader kinds of digital media or things like like Facebook and that kind of thing. And so in a sense, yes, it does have its own culture, but with the asterisk that there's both subcultures and broader links. And this is an interesting parallel to my earlier work in Indonesia where I was focusing on gay and lesbian Indonesians. So this is people halfway around the world from where I live in California 
who say that they're gay or lesbian, well, that idea of being gay or lesbian comes from somewhere, but for those folks, it's now part of Indonesian culture. So are they, in, is it Indonesian culture or not? Well, yes and no, and that's what makes it so interesting. And Second Life is, is very similar in that respect. Uh, compare the exotic and the mundane as ways of understanding Second Life or, or any culture. <clears throat> well, for, from where I come from as an anthropologist, um, one valuable thing that anthropologists have done for over a hundred years is learn and share information about cultures all around the world that can seem exotic to people in the West. And in many cases, anthropologists were the only people taking the time and trouble to go to those parts of the world and learn about those, those folks. And that was linked to colonialism and forms of power inequality, but also has been very valuable in many ways. Now, the, the downside of that in one sense is that there's often an assumption that when we do cultural research as an anthropologist or as, as anyone else, our goal is to find the exotic, is to find the weird, the thing that's really different. But often the most interesting things you can learn about people are the mundane and the everyday things. And for me in Second Life, I became very fascinated with things that seem very mundane and everyday, but are actually very meaningful to people. And so I think we want to be learning and listening both for things that seem uh, exotic or unusual, but also for things that seem very everyday. Because definitely when you're talking about virtual worlds or internet technologies, people love the exotic stuff. That's what the, the blogs want to talk about, right? Crazy stuff around sex or money or people doing all kinds of you know weird things. But if you go into Second Life, you also find a lot of suburban homes with people sitting around talking and rearranging their furniture. And that's actually once you get to know it, very interesting in its own right as well. You just have to spend some time with it and learn about it. Talk more about how your fieldwork in Indonesia compared with your fieldwork inside of uh, Second Life. Well, like I said, on, on purpose, I tried to use as similar of an approach as I could, but of course there are some interesting differences. I'm not Indonesian, first of all. I speak the Indonesian language. I've been going there for a long time. I have some familiarity with Indonesian cultural norms and how to behave, but I'm not from Indonesia. I'm not Indonesian and I don't live there long term. I stay in touch. I go back all the time. Um, but I am an outsider trying to respect and learn about Indonesians and their various cultures. With Second Life, in some ways, I'm in, sen in a sense more of a native in the sense that I have been in Second Life from quite early on and as someone in California, like a lot of people in Second Life are from California, so I'm a part of that culture in a different way. There's many people in Second Life who've spent much more time than I have in Second Life. There's people who were there before I was there, and there's people there who come come afterwards. Um, so there's an interesting sense of that being a member, but of course there's many anthropologists in the United States who do research in the United States. We don't all go to Indonesia. So the idea that you can study your own culture is a common idea now in anthropology for more than 50 years. And so, you know, for me personally, that was a difference. Um, you know, the, the accessibility of it, the ability to, to, you know, have a different kind of body whenever I want to have it or that kind of thing. But to me, one of the most surprising things about doing the research in, in Second Life was how little I had to change from what I do in Indonesia. It, re it really is quite similar, and I think that that says something very interesting about what it means to be a person and what it means to be a member of a community, that virtual communities are not a kind of, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus kind of thing. They're not just a completely, utterly different kind of community. They do share things with other kinds of communities that human beings form, and, and that's very interesting and important for us to understand. What does the exploration of virtual worlds reveal about the virtuality of the actual world? Right, well that's obviously a question that in my own research I'm, I'm very interested in. And for any kind of research that anyone does, we always try and research narrowly and think broadly. Because to do successful research, you have to have focus. You cannot study everything and do successful research. And that's especially true if you're studying something ethnographically where you want to get to know people, you want to spend time with people. You can only spend so much time with so many people in a day. So you have to make those decisions, but then you want to think about the broader impact. So in writing the book on Second Life, I wanted to tell a history of Second Life 
and speak about Second Life and the specific kinds of issues that show up in Second Life, but not everyone knows or cares about Second Life. Second Life isn't particularly small, it has around a million active users, but it's not big compared to Facebook or Google or a lot of other things out there, but of course those anthropologists that have made their careers on studying an island with a thousand inhabitants. We don't only study big stuff. We don't all study China for a reason. Instead, we research narrowly and try and think about bigger issues. And for me, in studying Second Life, one of the bigger issues that I've tried to think about is the fact that people are going online into all different kinds of online things, right? Whether that be Tumblr or email or Facebook or online games or using mobile phones. The fact that billions of people around the world are doing that in a pretty short period of time, five to 20 years, depending on how you count it, shows us that something is being carried across. Something about our everyday lives was already virtual to make it even possible for us to be able to adapt to these new technologies so quickly. And so I am very interested in ways that human social life has always been virtual in a sense. And part of that depends on how you define what the word virtual means, or what the word digital means, and so on. But keeping it to virtual for a moment, depending on how you define it, so much of our everyday interaction is not touchable, it's not physical, it's about language, it's about a social norm that I understand I should sit down when I walk into a room and everyone else is sitting down. You can't touch that belief or that habit. It's virtual in a sense, but it also is obviously very real. And so I, I still don't have a complete answer to that question, but I think it's really interesting and it's something that really motivated me doing the Second Life research and that still motivates me in the continuing research that I do even in the present day is trying to think about how is it that we've always been virtual and what is new and what is not new about our engagements with these new technologies. What is techni and how does understanding it help to understand Second Life? Well, whenever you do a research project, um, if it's successful, you get carried down a path you never thought you, know, you knew you would get carried down. Because research for me, when it goes well, is always about a process of discovery, and that's what makes it so much fun. And so as I started spending time in Second Life, I really noticed that creativity and crafting was important to lots of people, making things building things, talking about making things, even sort of making your identity, making your relationship. Crafting and, and making things was really, really important to people, and that's not limited to just Second Life. There's a reason why there's a game called World of Warcraft, right, or Minecraft, right? This idea of crafting and making is, is, is really common. And so I started trying to read or learn about the idea of crafting and I was just shocked and, and so surprised and excited as I really dug back into the you know, early Greek thought going all the way back that the original word for craft in the sort of Western tradition is techne, which is the same root of our word technology. Well, that's really interesting, right? And so I started thinking and learning more about that and about how, you know, going back to the earliest days of the Greeks, techne, which goes back to the myth of Prometheus, Techne is about art or craft, and it was held up as a different kind of thing than episteme, or the creation of knowledge, which in the Western tradition we see in the tree of knowledge that Adam and Eve um, eat from. And, you know, I'm an anthropologist, and I, I do research in Indonesia, and I by no means want to be Western-centric or Eurocentric or base everything on the Greeks. But the reality is that these technologies are obviously very deeply shaped by the Western tradition, even as that tradition gets transformed, just like the word gay gets transformed in Indonesia, these terms are now getting transformed that we're seeing so much technology use and production in Asia, in Africa, all around the world. But obviously this history is still interesting and important. And so I became very interested in this idea of craft and how it might help us to think about the role and place of technology in our current you know, human life are these different ideas of crafting and making that now you see showing up around hacking and 3D printers and, and blogging and in so many different domains. It's really amazing. Um, and what is the relationship between that idea of crafting and the idea of knowledge is something that I became very interested in as my research 
progressed and I found that thinking about techne helped me to answer a bunch of questions I had about the research that I was doing. So it was a, really a kind of intellectual serendipity that I was not planning on doing. When I began the research, I didn't even really know what the word techne meant in the original Greek. I, I, I didn't start the research with that word or that idea in mind. But from just talking to people and hanging out with people, I became interested in it, and it really was a very rich line of inquiry for me and a lot of fun. What is bleed over, and did you experience any of it yourself during your research? Well, um, bleed over, or now, nowadays a word I used to talk about, this is overlay. Um, you know, the, because virtual worlds are so new, and, and all these online technologies are so new, are so new from the very beginning, we've always been taking ideas and metaphors from the physical world into these online spaces. That's why a computer has a desktop and has folders, and we pick up a mouse, and we use all these metaphors from the physical world to think about how we use technology. That's why we talk about a web page as if it's a page of paper. And so the virtual worlds are no different, and when you go into Second Life or many of these virtual worlds, Avatars have bodies that look like human bodies. You can sometimes have other kinds of bodies, but that very often is the default. And you usually have a blue sky and green grass, even though you don't have to. You can have a red sky and blue grass, and some people do that. But many ideas that we use in these online environments at least begin with ideas that we're getting from the offline world, and then those are influencing it. Well. Of course, as things move forward, we start to get the possibility for influence to go in the other direction. And so you can get bleed back or ways that online phenomena start to affect things in the physical world. And that's not limited to Second Life. I've seen protests in Indonesia and in the United States where people will go, let's say, in front of the White House and hold up a sign that they've designed to look like a Facebook post or a Twitter feed. And so they're using an online idea in the physical world, right? That's a kind of a, a bleed, a, a bleed through, or, or blowback, or overlay, however you want to call it. And so you're seeing this in many different cases, and it's by no means uh, limited just to Second Life. But in Second Life, you obviously can get those kinds of examples as well. And I mentioned some in the book that I encountered of people saying they were looking in the washing machine for their favorite shirt, only to realize after a few minutes that they were actually thinking of a shirt in Second Life. And I'm actually involved in a research project right now working with people with Parkinson's disease that spend time in Second Life, where it, we don't know how, how uh, real this is for sure, but there may be some cases where they're able to improve their symptoms, reduce their symptoms, by moving their avatars in Second Life. Or we know that there's been a lot of research using Second Life and other virtual world technologies to help deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, or to deal with a phobia, or even just the basic idea of online education. If I study German by taking an online course, I can use that skill to speak German when I go to Germany. So that's also a kind of bleed-through of something that's happened online that's then affecting me in the physical world. And so obviously we're seeing all kinds of ways that online social interaction and activity is affecting things in the physical world and also now as we have this kind of augmented reality possibility that we see not just with things like Google Glass but even with just a cell phone um, that the overlay between the online and the offline can get very close and very rapid that you don't even have to go sit down at a desktop computer and turn on Second Life you can hold up a cell phone and use Yelp to find a restaurant or to use a map to find your way home so that's also a kind of bleed through so we're, we're obviously going to see more and more of this kind of bleed through. But to me, the interesting conceptual point that's part of the current research I'm doing is that even though we're having this bleed through, the online and the offline do retain a kind of distinctiveness. Just like a computer needs ones and zeros in order to work, the bleed through, in order for that to happen, requires that there be two distinct things that are bleeding through. And that's a really interesting area now where a whole bunch of people are doing interesting research. Now, you're an anthropologist, not a psychologist, but do you have any observations that you want to share about the effect on the residents of being in Second Life, what it does to their personalities? Well, I, I'm not a psychologist, and so I don't have um, 
you know, I haven't done sort of clinical trial kinds of studies on that. Of course, many other people have tried to do that in various various ways. But to me, as an anthropologist, I think what I all I can really say is that you see a lot of varied uh, kinds of responses. And one of the big problems that we have in a lot of these um, these issues around the influence of online worlds is whether it's correlation or causation. So, for instance. Do are computer games addictive, or is it that people with addictive personalities are attracted to computer games? Right, it's that kind of issue that is still um, making it difficult in many cases to know what the exact kind of causality can be. So you know, we certainly see many different kinds of effects that online worlds can have. There are some people for whom online worlds they really prefer them to be a domain set apart, where it's a fantasy space. They do something where it's an outlet for something that they don't feel they can do in the physical world or they don't want to do in the physical world. And that could be killing a dragon in a medieval fantasy game or being the other ge another gender, being a woman when you're normally a man. Um, it could be that kind of thing where you really want it to be something that's very set apart. There's also people who see a fairly tight connection between their virtual world interactions and their offline interactions, whether that's a teacher and students or members of a family who meet in Second Life instead of calling each other on the phone or you know whatever, that kind of thing where you can see a fairly close connection. But of course, you don't even have to make that decision because in many of these virtual world environments, including Second Life, you can have more than one identity, more than one avatar, just like I have more than one Gmail account, right? It's not limited to virtual worlds. And when you have that possibility of multiplicity, that creates yet a whole other new set of possibilities because I can both have a fantasy life online and a life online that's quite closely tied to my physical world identity. And so I don't even have to choose. And so there's some people that do only one or almost only one, and some people that do only the other or almost only the other, but there's a bunch of people that do both and that you don't have to decide one or the other, and that multiplicity, I think, is something that we're still trying to learn more about when you don't even have to make one decision. What does a virtual world mean to me? What does going online mean to me? Is it a, a way to escape from my identity or is it a way to embrace my identity? To even ask the question in that way is to ask the wrong question because for so many people it's not one or the other. It's both and. It's both of those things to people, for a lot of people. And so it's, um, you know, I, I'm not a psychologist, but from the research that I've done, you know, what has really impressed me are the, the multiple different ways that people are using and engaging with these technologies in ways that the original designers never intended or imagined and in ways that are constantly shifting. Um, to me is something that's so fascinating and interesting to learn more about. How does the ownership of the virtual world Second Life by Linden Lab affect Second Life culture? Well, a big issue with a lot of these online worlds is that they are mostly owned by for-profit profit corporations. And there are ones that are owned by nonprofits or that are completely open source and free there's uh, versions of Second Life using something called OpenSim that are much cheaper or free. But the reality is the vast majority, all of the top online worlds, all of the top social networking sites, all of the top social sites' websites are owned by for-profit corporations. In fact, I think the only website that is not owned by a for-profit corporation that's in the top 20 even is Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is almost unique nowadays in being a well-trafficked website or virtual environment that is open source or at least non nonprofit. And so for all of these things, and by no means is it limited to Second Life or virtual worlds, there's really important and interesting uh, political questions about governance and control. And for many of these virtual world environments or online games or, or social network sites like Facebook, where they want to get a lot of users and they don't want people to run away from them. They have a vested interest in leaving a light footprint and letting people do whatever they want, so to speak, and not being too controlling, but nonetheless they are often setting the parameters for what is acceptable, what is doable, in a sense what is thinkable in these online worlds. And of course 
um, users and participants are always doing unexpected kinds of things. But the, these are really interesting issues of ownership and governance, especially because they're often controlled by terms of service agreements that were never designed for ruling or controlling societies. They were designed for pirating software so that when you get on a plane and you go to France or Germany or China or anywhere, you don't get out at the airport and get handed the constitution of that country and then be asked, do you agree or disagree with this constitution and check yes or no. And if you check no, you get put on a plane back to where you came from. That's just not how we do governance in the physical world. Yet these online environments are often governed by these terms of service where you check, I agree, one case, one time, and it's assumed that you've basically given your consent for everything for, you know, all time in the future. So, you know, for something like Second Life, um, the actual consequences of the, of the governance are not always direct or in your face, but they're there. And I, I, in my book and in, in things I've written, I track some examples of that. So, for instance, there was a while where you could teleport anywhere in Second Life. Then they changed it to where you could only teleport your body, your avatar, to certain places called hubs as a way to sort of make people gather and also to make certain land more valuable. It created certain kinds of problems. So after several years, they went back to the original model where you could teleport anywhere. And those decisions were final. Once the company made it, they actually controlled the world. It's like making gravity pull up. You know, no dictator in the physical world can do that, no matter how powerful they are. Hitler could not make gravity go up, but the people who run these um, virtual worlds could if they felt like it, right? They, they have that kind of power. And so, you know, in most cases, it's, they do things with a fairly light hand, but not always, and it's something we do need to be vigilant about. And I would say in particular, um, in the case of things that are oriented around children, Many of the largest virtual worlds and online games and such are for kids, um, not surprisingly. Uh, many of the top ones are for kids. And there's often an idea that when children are involved, then you have um, permission to be much more intrusive in how you chaperone or control what kids are able to say and do online, even the words they can type or speak. And so many of these virtual worlds and online games designed for children are very strictly controlled. And that might be a good thing in some cases. Of course, we want to protect kids, but we really need to be careful about that. So, you know, for instance, as someone who I am gay and I've studied gay people for many years and lesbian LGBT folks all, you know, in Indonesia and elsewhere, many of these online environments for kids will just assume that none of them are gay and that gay content by definition or even talking about it is too dangerous to talk about. And then you will often have these young people who think that they might be bisexual or gay or lesbian or transgender and they can't access information or support because that's considered to be adult by definition. But of course there are young you know, queer folks and they, they deserve access to information. So these are really interesting issues around governance and control um, that are on, in the headlines right now even as we speak around the NSA. And so they, you know, things like Second Life are great laboratories to look at specific ways these issues can come up in certain contexts, but the lessons learned or the questions that are opened by looking at these things are by no means limited to virtual worlds. They impact every aspect of online interaction. Why did you write a book instead of presenting your material online? Well, I talked about um, when I when I wrote the book that because I was trying to replicate sort of traditional anthropological methods, I wanted to also replicate the traditional product of anthropological research, which is the the book form. And the book is online; you can get it as a Kindle book, all that kind of thing. And so, in some ways, it is online. Um, I didn't do it as a blog post; I did it as a book. And it was originally a physical book, even though it's now a virtual book as well. So part of it was because of that, but part of it also was an issue about genre. And a book does different things than a, an article does or a blog post does. Um, a book forces you to take some time. It forces you to take a step back. It can't be about the news of the day. It takes a year or two for a book to get published. And that, I think, is really valuable because it forces you to try and write in a way that won't become immediately dated. That's not about sort of the journalistic news of what's happened this day or this week. And we need that as well. We need all of these different genres. 
that there is value in genres that take more time and that are trying to sort of step back and connect things and, and look at a broad set of issues around questions and topics that aren't just about 2013 or even 2012 and 2013 that are hopefully about broader questions about the human condition, about in this case technology that will, will last for a longer time. And I also do a lot of blog posts and so I have no problem with doing them. I've done many different kinds of blog posts. And so once again I don't see it as an either or kind of issue, but I, I do think that the, the book format, and I'm actually getting ready to start working on a, a new book now, um, can be very valuable, especially in this technology domain, for allowing us to sit back and ask kinds of questions and think through kinds of issues that are harder to do in a, in a blog format that is done more quickly and is shorter. Once again, not because I have any problem with that format at all. We need different formats. We need different genres. They all do different kinds of work that are all valuable in their own way. Um, but in the technology space, often there's a real emphasis on the sort of blog kind of thing that shows, out, shows up immediately and you can see on Flipboard or on a reader or something and even with my students, because I'm a professor, I have a lot of students, and my graduate students even will sometimes worry, oh, my work is going to be dated by the time it comes out. And so that then pushes me to tell them, you know, how can we think about what you're doing in a way that it won't be dated by the time it comes out? It's not going to be about the news of the week. It's going to be about how the news of the week is an example for us to think about a deep underlying issue that people have been thinking about for decades. That's the goal of that kind of genre. Talk about what AFK means and, and what importance it has for experiencing Second Life. Well, AFK, and this is another uh, uh, example of sort of the unexpected. So AFK means away from keyboard, and it's a very simple idea where in a virtual world or an online game or it could even be Facebook or whatever in some cases, if you're chatting with someone, if you get up and you leave the computer, or nowadays the mobile phone or the iPad, without shutting down the program, then you're away from keyboard, you're AFK. And in the case of a virtual world like Second Life, your avatar might still be there in a social situation, dancing at a party or sitting with some people, but you actually physically aren't there with the avatar for one minute or for ten minutes or however long it's taken that you're going to go get your coffee or answer the front door or do whatever it is that you're going to do. And AFK is a great example of something that seems utterly boring and uninteresting when you first think about it. It's something that people don't really talk about. They just think of it as the weather or something that's quite boring and uninteresting. But when you dig at it, when you scratch under the surface and think about it, it becomes very interesting and it's something that's a great example of something I stumbled on when I was doing my research that I didn't expect to find interesting but became extremely interesting to me because a very interesting topic that is debated in technology studies is what's known as the idea of presence. How is it that you can be present in an online situation? And another topic that is very debated in internet studies is the idea of immersion. And what does it mean to be immersed online? Do you have to be like the Matrix movies where you put on goggles and are completely immersed in that sense? Or can you be immersed even when you're reading CNN.com? Does that count as immersion or not? So ideas of presence and ideas of immersion have been very debated and talked about in technology studies and internet studies and in very interesting ways. And what I realized with a shock when I was thinking more about AFK and doing participant observation and watching people go AFK and walk, watching people respond to it is that it allowed you to have a kind of immersion without presence or in some cases a kind of presence without immersion that you could be present in a situation in Second Life you're sitting there in a room and people might try and talk to you or they might try and push over your avatar but you weren't there, you weren't immersed, you were getting coffee you were answering the door and that's really interesting and that's also a really interesting difference with the physical world. I can daydream, I can sleep, I can be unconscious, but none of those things are quite the same as AFK. Because with AFK you, want, you have to ask someone, are you there right now? I can't tell. Did you go AFK? 
Um, that can sort of happen with daydreaming, but it's not quite the same. There's nothing in the physical world that's exactly the same as AFK. And so it's a really interesting uh, test issue to think about a whole range of issues about online social interaction that I just stumbled on from doing participant observation. There you really see a power of ethnography as a method, of ethnographic methods compared to surveys, for instance, and surveys are extremely valuable and important. We need a lot more surveys. But if I had designed a survey that I would give people to fill out um, in Second Life, I never would have thought to have a question on that survey about AFK. I didn't even know what AFK meant when I started my research, that it meant away from keyboard. How would I have known to even put such a boring thing on a survey? I never would have known. And it's that kind of research that you do as an ethnographer where you plunge in and find out what's going on that can lead you down paths to find things that you never would have found otherwise. And there's weaknesses of ethnographic methods. I can't interview 10,000 people like I can with a survey. So once again, it's not to say that it's superior to other methods, just that it gives us a different kind of data, a different kind of knowledge, and especially right now in the era of big data, where there's a lot of interest in big quantitative data sets, it's really important to remind people that ethnography is also a kind of big data, that it also gives us a kind of big picture understanding of social interaction that you'll never be able to get from a data scrape of what we typically think of as sort of big data kinds of information not because that kind of, of data collection or knowledge production is uninteresting or useless in any way, but that it's different. And all of these different ways of generating knowledge and of learning about people all have something to, to bring to the table. So again, it's not either or, but both and more. It's both and more. And I think, you know, it's like facets of a diamond. The more perspectives that you get to look at any kind of question, the more interesting kinds of answers that it is that you're going to get. And, and usually one researcher can't do all those different methods. That's what friends and colleagues are for, is that you work together, you read each other's work, and, and from that kind of multidimensional approach, you learn things that you would not learn from just using one method. But for any individual researcher, we can use a couple different methods, but none of us can, can do effectively a big survey and ethnographic research. That's just not possible. And so that's what colleagues are for and, and what collaborating with people is for. And that's, that's the real promise of that kind of collaborative work. What characterizes intimacy within Second Life? How did you study it? And what does it say about Second Life? Um, well, intimacy ended up being a whole chapter of my Second Life book because it was something that ended up being important to a lot of the people that I that I talked to and it's a, it's a gen, in general an interesting issue that shows up with the internet in general because one of the most fundamental things about the internet is that you can interact with people who are far from you physically who are in different countries different places around the world miles and miles away like we're doing right now like that's one of the most fundamental things online technology does is shrink space in a certain sense. It allows for a kind of direct interaction, synchronic interaction that you couldn't have otherwise. Now, does that generate intimacy or not? What counts as intimacy? Then you get a whole set of interesting questions. And intimacy at a kind of distance is, once again, not completely new. People have been writing love letters to each other for over 100 years, and it's not like we can't have intimacy at a distance before the internet. Um, so we need to think about that history. And then what's different about the internet? Because I could send love letters to someone, but that's different from meeting them in World of Warcraft and killing a dragon together with them, or meeting them in Second Life and building a house and going to a movie or <coughs> going dancing or, or doing something with them like that. And so it's really interesting to see how in these online environments you can have that kind of intimacy. And then some people in Second Life would talk about how they felt you could either have more intimacy or a different kind of intimacy than you could have in the physical world. As I mentioned in the book, one person very poetically summed it up for me by saying, in the physical world, you get to know people from the outside in, but in Second Life, you get to know people from the inside out, in that you can meet someone in Second Life and not know right away how old they are, what their background is, and you could become their friend or fall in love with them, 
with someone that maybe you would never even talk to in the physical world. And a colleague of mine here at Irvine, another anthropologist, Bonnie Nardi, who did very interesting research in World of Warcraft, has talked about in World of Warcraft, her guild in, you know, included a plumber, you know, a teenager, someone who's retired. Well, you know, she is a professor in her everyday life. She's mostly interacting with other professors and with students. She really doesn't spend a lot of time normally talking to plumbers. They might come fix her sink, but she got to know people from other occupations in World of Warcraft more than she does in the physical world where she might see someone who's a plumber at the grocery store or something, but she's not going to necessarily interact with them week after week and hear how their day went and learn about their life in a sense. And so that's a kind of intimacy that you can get online that is moving across class and occupation as well as physical location. That is the interesting potential of these online technologies and so there's all kinds of interesting possibilities for intimacy and this is something like I said that people have been talking about from the earliest days of the internet and you know people were getting married and falling in love over the telegraph in the 19th century. So once again this is not something that's completely new. Intimacy and technology have a long, long history. What's interesting now is how are these new technologies changing it um, and in what ways. That includes 3D kinds of realistic environments like Second Life, but also very interesting forms of low bandwidth intimacy where people have done research looking at how sending short text messages, you know, I love you to your spouse or partner every night before you go to bed or during the day or whatever can be incredibly meaningful to people as a kind of digital intimacy that is not predicated on having an avatar in a beautiful three-dimensional world, but just sending a short little text message can be a very powerful intimate act in some cases that is made possible by these digital technologies. So there's so many different kinds of intimacies that happen um, with these online technologies that are, are really interesting to look at and that a lot of people are looking at. Talk about the community aspects of Second Life. Um, well, just like with intimacy, the idea of virtual community goes back to the earliest days of these online technologies, like the well, the whole Earth Electronic Link, um, you know, the early days of CompuServe. Um, you know, you had people going online to be alone and as loners just to read the newspaper. And you had people going online just to interact with one person or to send email. But the lots and lots of people go online to join communities. That goes way back to the earliest days of the, the internet and is taking all kinds of new forms now of people building forms of online community where it's not alone and it's not just one person, but it can be a community of five or ten people or a hundred or a thousand or a million people. And that changes what the very word community means, of course. And so, you know, you see so many different kinds of communities around interest, reconnecting with old friends and family doing it around work or around education or around other kinds of interests. And you see all of that happening in Second Life as well. Because a virtual world has a kind of place characteristic to it, like Second Life, you can have islands or houses or plots of land. You can also see communities that are oriented around what's called a build or an area, a piece of land in Second Life. So you can have a club or a house or an island and people who are uh, collectively own that island or maybe just like to go there and become members of a, of a community in that island or help maintain it and design it and hold events together and do that kind of thing. You also have interest group communities in Second Life, all kind, you know, social communities, friendship networks. So just as with the internet more broadly, we see a huge range of, of communities that can be transnational in some cases, but can also be very localized in other cases. There's just a huge range of that. And obviously, you know, with the rise of things like Facebook, we've seen how the idea of social networking and the idea of the social, of the community, has become, in, for many people, the fundamental aspect of what the Internet is. Not to everyone and not all the time, but it really has moved center stage for a lot of people. There's been a real move towards community um, as a kind of central aspect of online social interaction um, that is just marked by the rise of these social media like Facebook and Twitter that you see more broadly in these other contexts as well. That doesn't mean that solo online activity is ever going to go away. 
And a lot of people, more than we often realize, go online to be alone. And that's going to keep happening, you know, or to meet with one other person. But it certainly seems clear that the social aspect of online interaction across a whole range of genres is here to stay um, and is really interesting and important and something that we really want to keep researching because it's taking a lot of different forms. That, that certainly refutes the uh, presupposition that uh, people who use the computer a lot are uh, socially isolated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can be socially isolated whether you use a computer or not. And actually, part of that, I mean, that was always a stereotype. And also, that stereotype in some ways is linked to the era of the desktop, when people using a computer meant they were sitting in a special room in a basement somewhere. But now, you know, I'm talking to you on a laptop that I carry back and forth and I take into a cafe. And nowadays, you know, so many people are going online using tablets or smartphones. And so the idea that online interaction um, means that you're not interacting offline is just clearly not real anymore. And we see even now with like, um, you know, tel TV, you know, the whole TV industry is being reshaped by the fact that people have learned that people at home watching television nowadays almost always have a tablet or iPhone open at the same time and they might be texting or commenting about the movie that they're watching and television shows nowadays are being written with that in mind to stimulate those kinds of of opportunities and so you know people can be loners or people might want to be alone certain times of the day but the technology no longer demands that by any stretch of the imagination. What role does money play in the shaping of the SL experience? Well money has been an interesting aspect of all internet experience given that it was originally designed as a military and educational infrastructure that was not so money oriented but then you know for a while now has been commercialized and massively so and the, the role of, of commerce and corporations in the internet is, is utterly fascinating and Second Life was very interesting because fairly early on not at the very beginning but even by the time I started when it was just a year old they had, were uh, pioneers in creating a, a kind of in-world currency that could be freely exchanged for the U.S. dollar. And their, the, the company that owns Second Life, Linden Lab, their business model was that instead of hiring a lot of staff to design interesting content for people to look at, that people inside the virtual world would develop the content that other people would consume. So people talk about this sometimes as prosuming because it's combining producing and consuming. So the consumer is also the producer. The consumer is making the content that other people are consuming. And so for that model to work, they needed an incentive for people to make stuff. And some people make stuff out of the goodness of their heart or because they love to do it or they've always wanted to make things. And Second Life allows for that. And you can make things, build things, design things, and give them away for free. And lots of people do that because they want to and they think it's fun. But it also allows you to create things and sell them for uh, an, an in-world currency, Linden dollars, that can be exchanged for U.S. dollars and by extension any physical world currency. And so... And that's been a very interesting model, and, and there are, are other um, online environments that now allow that in various ways. And in fact, you could even think of something like eBay or Etsy as a kind of version of this, where people go to Etsy or eBay to find items to purchase, but those items are not manufactured by a factory owned by eBay or a factory owned by Etsy. Instead, people make those things already, and Etsy is serving as a clearinghouse for it, or eBay, and, and so other users are bringing things to the table that then other people are going to come by. So you can see this, this kind of model um, showing up in different incarnations in ways that aren't unique to virtual worlds. And you know, other great examples of this include things like YouTube or Facebook. When YouTube was bought by Google, Already at that point, and that was several years ago now, YouTube was worth over a billion dollars. Google paid, I forget what the number was, over a billion dollars for uh, YouTube. And when Google bought that, as many people have pointed out, they paid the YouTube company a billion dollars for it. But all the people who made those videos of their kittens and cats, or if this video we're making right now goes up on YouTube, none of those people got one penny for having made the content that actually made YouTube valuable, right? Or Facebook is now you know, listed on the stock market. It makes a lot of money. But the people who are posting to Facebook and making all that content, they don't get anything 
right, for that free access to Facebook. And so you can see there a similar kind of market logic to what you've seen in Second Life, um, where people are making the content that other people are consuming so that the companies can actually have quite small staff. They don't have as many staff as you might expect because they aren't making the content. They're making the infrastructure. They're designing the, the platform and updating the platform, but they are actually offloading content generation onto other quote-unquote users who are now also producers. And many people would say that is actually the sort of wave of the future for the internet more broadly. All right. Um, and uh, were there specific issues of governance that came up in your uh, during your participant observation that you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't think there's any other particular ones other than the ones that I've uh, uh, mentioned. I mean, those are all really important uh, issues that I brought up. I'll, I have to I'll have to leave fairly soon because I have another meeting coming up. So I'm trying to think if I have any other burning examples. Okay, tell me how much more time you've got, and I'll uh, I'll. Uh, shape the rest here for that. I can do like uh, five to ten more minutes. Great, that's great. T tell us what the value is of having an anthropology of Second Life or of other virtual worlds. Well, I think that the um, the value of it is that we, as an anthropologist, we want to go wherever human beings are um, because there's aspects to human existence that we won't learn from doing a survey or based on what people write themselves in a blog post. And so we want to understand what people are actually doing, not just what they say that they're doing. And so it's really valuable to have ethnographers studying all of these different aspects of, of online life because all of this technology and it gets you know more and more complicated and fancier as the days go by. But it all comes down still to humans and to users. If people aren't using it, it's not going to go anywhere. And so we need to understand the human beings and how it is that we are involved with these technologies, how they're shaping us and how we're shaping them. It's a big question, but maybe you could deal with it briefly. What is create, creator capitalism and how does it relate to neoliberalism and how does what happens in Second Life uh, illustrate that? Well, actually, it's very much what I was just talking about with an example like, like eBay um, or Etsy or something like Second Life where creativity itself is the kind of labor that is shaping these new forms of capitalism so that instead of just uh, laboring to make objects or this, what we call the service industry, right, um, or even the information age and the information industry, now we see this age of techne I've talked about where creativity itself becomes the kind of form of value that you're seeing being produced in a lot of quarters of contemporary capitalism that is linked to the earliest phases of capitalism but also has interesting characteristics of its own and in some ways I mean what neoliberalism really means if you take away all the jargon is you know the use of market models to do things formerly done by the state and so there is a kind of neoliberalism that's happening in some of these cases because often what's happening around the world is in many cases governments are rather than trying to regulate what's happening online they're asking the companies to do it so they're trying to offload that burden of governing onto the second life company Linden Lab or onto Blizzard the company that that owns and runs World of Warcraft or onto Facebook and so there is a kind of neoliberal logic to that extent that it's about offloading what had previously been seen as a responsibility or duty of the state and thus of a kind of elected government to a private corporation to a market model and so you you do see that kind of neoliberalist aspect to it because even in you know China or other places where there's a lot of government intervention in the internet they still aren't necessarily themselves making the websites or running the online content they're monitoring the companies that are doing it but they're still offloading it onto the private sector in most cases and so there is definitely a neoliberal logic in that in that specific sense and so for me, the, the creationist capitalism thing that I became interested in in coming up with that word was just thinking about how all the stuff about techne and creativity, it's about personal growth and liberation and being able to do beautiful things that you couldn't do before and the ability to be creative. But it's more than that. It's also about money. 
and about economics and about power and about inequality. And so for me, when we talk about creativity, I really wanted to have that idea of creationist capitalism and, and talk about that because I didn't want to give off a sense that creativity was about a kind of pure state of unshackled bliss where people just are making things and it's just a wonderful thing and it can be wonderful but it is still part of a capitalist world system that we've all caught up in and I think it's important to keep that in mind. It's extremely important to keep that in mind because it links up to identity and it also links up to questions of governance and power. Okay, finally, let's wrap up. I know it's a big question also, but talk about the implications of your of your research and your findings and your theories for understanding the digital future. Well, <clears throat> um, I mean, what I'm trying to do right now and some of the work that I'm trying to think about is that we're living in an age now where we're seeing more and more forms of augmented technology and movements back and forth between the online and the offline more and more like I was saying before even like holding up a phone or, or doing that kind of thing where now we don't have a kind of digital divide in an earlier sense where whole parts of the world had no access to the internet you know in Indonesia it's amazing to see how now even people with very limited income have some kind of online access and it's getting better and better year by year and so something that I'm interested in is there is sometimes a tendency that I think is mistaken to think that the online and the offline are blurring. I don't think that blurring is the right way to think about the digital future. Um, I think of the digital like the original word of digit. Digits like digits in a hand. That meaning of the digital. And for a hand to work, you have to have gaps between the fingers. Um, otherwise, the fingers don't work. And a digital computer needs ones and zeros in order to work it needs gaps. It needs gaps in order to work. And so what seems to be happening as we move towards this digital future is faster and faster moving back and forth between these gaps. But the gaps aren't going away. You need the gaps in order for there to even be such a thing as an online or an offline. And I think one reason that people get confused in some cases and want to think about blurring or want to say you can't keep the online and the offline separate is because of a mistaken notion of what we mean by the word separate. And that gaps, people often forget that gaps connect. Gaps don't just separate. So the gap between online and offline is not an artificial separation. It's more like the gap between neurons in your brain, a synapse, where things are moving back and forth very fast, but you need that gap in order for the whole thing to work. And so predicting the future is a very hard thing to do, right? And lots of people in the technology sector want to do that, and they get paid to do that, and they're wrong year after year after year. And so I don't want to try and predict the future, except in a very general sense, which is to say in a very general, even sort of philosophical sense, I don't think that the online and the offline are going to fuse because that's a mistaken notion of what the digital is. What's going to happen is that they are going to intersect and, and overlay and go back and forth faster and faster and in more and more ways, which is going to be really interesting for us to, to track and to study. Um, but that those gaps will remain and should be part of what it is that we're trying to study. Because if you look at the history of technology, you see that whenever a new technology comes out, you often get reactions, immediate reactions, that are very negative or very positive. Utopia or dystopia. The new technology is going to fix everything or it's going to ruin everything. And time and time again, when a new technology comes out, you see those two narratives appear. And time and time again, those two narratives are wrong. Time and time again, we see that the answer lies in between, that it's more complicated and that in the end it really comes down to what we do with the technology, not what the technology does, because technology doesn't do anything by itself. And so I think in terms of thinking about a digital future, what is important is for us to think about how can we better understand what's happening 
so that we can anticipate and respond to it more effectively so that we have a digital future that includes as many people as possible and does as much good for the world as is possible because it's not guaranteed that it will go in any one direction. All right, good. Well, I want to thank you very much for your work and people can, uh, can see all the details in Coming of Age and Second Life available from Princeton University Press and thanks for appearing on Utopia News tonight, uh, this you. afternoon. Thank you.